When I installed the VFD on my lathe a few videos back, I neglected to install a circuit breaker and fuse on the power input. And at least one of you was kind enough to point that out in the comments. So today, we're going to fix it. Welcome back to Cloud42, I'm James. You may remember a video series I did a few weeks ago where I installed a VFD in my lathe. Now, those videos have been very popular. In fact, they've generated more views than any other content on this channel by a significant margin. Now, when I built the electronics enclosure for the VFD, I did not put in a fuse or a circuit breaker as shown in the manual, but today we're gonna fix that. Let's start by taking a look at the manual and talking about what they're recommending and why they're recommending it. Oh, and if you're watching this video at the end of the other playlist, yeah, I've lost a bunch of weight since then. This is the L510 VFD manual. And in the manual, they have a handy diagram showing how to connect it to power. So starting with the power supply, they recommend connecting it through a circuit breaker, a magnetic contactor, an AC line reactor, a fast acting fuse, an input noise filter, and then to the VFD. And then on the output side of the VFD, an output noise filter, and finally the motor. So let's talk through what we have and what I did and didn't do the first time through. So the power supply, I'm just taking this from a, it's 115 volt, I'm taking it from a 30 amp circuit that's coming off of the breaker panel in my shop. They are showing here a molded circuit breaker. I did not put a circuit breaker in the box with the VFD because it's about a foot and a half from the panel and I've already got the breaker in the panel. We'll look at this in a little bit more detail. We're gonna put one of these in uh, today. Then they show a magnetic contactor, which we have, and then they show an AC line reactor. Now in this position, they call this out that when you're using the inverter and you're supplying it with a high capacity power source, which would they're saying greater than 600 kVA, which is you know industrial, then using an AC line reactor here can improve the power factor. And what that means is an inverter is going to pull current that's out of phase with the voltage. And so the power factor will not be one. Uh, it'll run at some lower power factor. And ultimately, all that means is that the current that's being drawn is not in phase with the voltage. And this is what you get when you have a reactive load, or in this case, an actively switched load. For a residential installation, it doesn't really matter because you're not built based on that and you're not running up against the capacity limits of the supply. In an industrial setting, often you'll wanna put an AC line reactor in there because power is billed based on the power factor, not just based on the total um, power consumption. So in this case, uh, we don't need it. We don't have a large power supply and I don't get billed based on that and it wouldn't matter anyway. Then they show a fast acting fuse. Now, why do you need a fuse when you've already got a circuit breaker? We can talk about that. Um, then the input noise filter, which we have, and then the inverter. And then on the output noise filter, um, this is specifically to reduce system interference is how they have this called out. And we actually put some uh, chokes on the output and to, to reduce interference. So we do have an output noise filter even though it's not a separate module. And then the motor. Okay, let's start with the circuit breaker. Now, in this case, I have the inverter in the box and it's wired up to a power supply that already has a circuit breaker. Why would we need another one? Well, we probably don't to prevent a fire, but the one thing here is that the circuit breaker in the wall is 30 amps. And this device is, the, the inverter is only drawing 19 amps maximum according to the spec. So if you take that 19 amps, you multiply it by 1.25 and then round up to the nearest available circuit breaker size, you would want a 25 amp breaker on here. Is a 25 amp breaker really that different from a 30 amp breaker when you're talking about an overload situation like this with 10 gauge wire? Yeah, probably not, but we might as well. So I picked up a circuit breaker. This is a DIN rail mounted circuit breaker rated for 25 amps. And this is rated for 230 volt 
uh, 400 volt service. So this will be fine for the 115 and it's rated at 6,000 amp braking capacity, which if you find the specs elsewhere in the manual should be plenty for this operation. Now, if you've never seen a DIN rail um, circuit breaker before, these just mount on a piece of pressed rail. This mounts into the box, and then this has a little spring-loaded tab so that it clips onto that. And this is just a real handy way in industrial enclosures to put a lot of devices together without having to drill holes and have a bunch of screws and mess around with that. You just put up the rail and you snap this together. We already have a piece of DIN rail in the box with the, um, uh, with the VFD because we have the magnetic contactor on it. So I figured I'll go ahead and get a circuit breaker that mounts on that. I've already cut a little bit longer scrap of this DIN rail we can put in the box and that'll make it really easy to mount the circuit breaker. Now, when we get this in the box and have to start thinking about uh, wiring it up, conventionally, the only real requirement for code that I've seen in terms of mounting these is you need to orient it so that if you have a switch that goes up and down, up is the on position and down is the off position. So that means it needs to go in the box with this side up. Now, by convention, the power would feed in the top and out the bottom, but since this one is not marked, um, doesn't have either side marked as in or out, then it doesn't matter. You can run the current through either direction. It's AC, so it's alternating anyway, but if the total current exceeds the rated current of 25 amps, the breaker will trip and disconnect, and it doesn't matter which way you feed. When we get it in the box, we'll talk a little bit more about how we're going to want to route the wiring and why and if that matters. So that's the circuit breaker. Now let's talk about this fast acting fuse. If you already have a circuit breaker, why do you need a fuse? Well, what it says here is to protect peripheral equipment, install fast acting fuses in accordance with the specifications in section 11. Now this manual has no section 11, but there's one clue, fast acting. And if you actually dig here in the back, you'll find it not in section 11, but in section A1, page five, they have the spec. This is the L510-101, and they want a Busman 25ET, which is a 690 volt fuse, 25 amps. Now, I went and looked at these, and this is a British standard two stud mount uh, fuse, which is really inconvenient for the things that I can get locally and the kind of mounting that I have in the box here. So I found an equivalent fuse or a very similar fuse with a similar capacity and similar braking capacity. And this is an Eaton FWC 25A10F. I don't expect that to mean anything to you. It didn't mean anything to me. I grabbed the data sheet. It turns out there's a lot more to fuses than just the current rating. This is a 10 by 38 millimeter fuse and this size makes it suitable for 600 volts AC or DC. These ones are available up to 32 amps, and the interrupt rating is 200 kiloamp RMS. So this thing will break a 200,000 amp short circuit, 550,000 amp at 700 volts DC. But when we're talking about AC, um, which is what we're dealing with here, this will break a 200,000 amp um, short circuit, which is what's called for in the spec. So this fuse will be suitable. Then we need a holder for it. And you can buy DIN rail holders for fuses. So this, is, this sits in the DIN rail, has the same kind of mounting, and then it has a little lever that you can open and it has a little pocket to hold the fuse. And while this is open, the fuse is held up in a position where it's not contacting either side. And then when you close it, it makes contact. So that makes it safe, even though I personally won't do it, I'll disconnect the power, but it should be safe to change this fuse when this is energized on one side. Now, technically, you can feed this from the bottom or from the top, but this is the same kind of situation. Convention is for the power to come in the top and feed down. And the way this is built, the fuse sits in like this, at this angle, and then when you close it, it pulls down into the clips. And so when the fuse is inserted in the up position, 
The top is a long way from the clips on this side. The bottom is disconnected from the clips, but it's very, very close. And so I've done some tests with a meter, and if you close this part way, the bottom end of the fuse actually makes contact with this side. So what that means is, if the power is being fed from the bottom, when the fuse is in this angle, it's live, and that cap is live. And if you could reach in there and touch it, it would be possible to get a shock if you're messing around with this with the power on. For that reason, again, I'm probably not gonna do that, but for that reason, I'm gonna wanna feed the power from this end because you have to get this completely closed almost to this point before the fuse makes contact with the connector on this side. So that means that if you have the fuse out open far enough that you can touch it, it'll be disconnected from the input power. So that's the way I'm gonna wire it. So let's come back to the initial question that I asked, and that is, if you've already got a circuit breaker, why do you need a fuse? And there are essentially two answers that I've been able to find. One is that this is what's called a semiconductor fuse. Does it actually say it here? It doesn't. In the listing on Mauser's website, it shows this as a semiconductor fuse. And the idea, as I've uh, come to understand, of a semiconductor fuse is that it blows very, very quickly. So if you end up with a short circuit on the motor side of this and a massive current draw, the idea is that this fuse should be able to blow fast enough that it will protect the semiconductors, the IGBTs that are in the VFD. The idea being that a short circuit wouldn't destroy the VFD, it would pop the fuse and the VFD would survive. Now, that's theory. In my experience, um, Semiconductors always blow first and save the fuse, but you know that's just been my experience. The other thing I was able to turn up, I did some reading in the forums about why you would do this and why does the manual call for this, and I saw some suggestions that the reason that they call for a fuse is because that's the configuration that they used when they ran this device through safety and compliance testing. Uh, this VFD is UL listed, and from everything I've read, it would have been tested by Underwriters Laboratory with this specified fuse in place. Now why is that? There's lots of speculation out there, lots of speculation about what parts were available and could be imported and were suitable for the test rigs, um, but in the end it seems to be that this was UL tested with the fuse, so they spec it with the fuse. But in general, the fuse isn't really needed if you've got the circuit breaker. Well, they show it. It's inexpensive. I'll go ahead and put it in. Let's go over to the box and take a look at how all this stuff mounts. Now, first and most important, I have this unplugged from the power supply. Now we need to replace that DIN rail and put in a bigger piece. So I'm just going to leave this contactor connected and I'm just gonna release it off the rail. That should allow me to pull it to the side and replace this rail with a bigger piece. Ways this need to go. Okay, let's put the rail back on. I put the contactor back on the rail. Okay, now the circuit breaker. And the fuse holder. And I'm gonna have to move this ground wire slightly to make this fit. Okay, so let's talk about how we're gonna feed this. There's a couple of ways we could do it. The hot wire, you can see, 
is coming into the top of the contactor right here. And we need to move that over and run that into the circuit breaker. Now, and then from the other side of the circuit breaker, we need to go back into the top of the contactor. So again, there's a couple of ways to do this. One way would be to run the power in the bottom and then just loop it over uh, and then come out the bottom here and we're gonna have to do something to come around to go into the top of this anyway. So I don't think I'm gonna bother with any of that. I think I'm just gonna bring the power in the top here, bring a wire out the bottom, bring it around back in the top of the contactor, bring a wire out the bottom, bring it around, put it in the top of the fuse, and then go from there down to the connector here on the filter input. Of course, this whole project's gonna take a lot longer if I keep grabbing the wrong screwdriver. Okay, there's the power coming into the circuit breaker, coming out of the circuit breaker, going into the contactor. And now we need to take the power out of the contactor and into the fuse holder. in through the circuit breaker, power through the contactor, power into the fuse holder, and then the last part is going to be the fuse holder down to the filter. Okay. Well, let's see how it works. Let me go get a fuse. Okay, I think we're good. Let's apply power. Turn on the circuit breaker. Now I should be able to switch the contactor on from the control panel of the lathe and let's see what happens. Well, unsurprisingly it worked. Let's see, let's turn the lathe on and see if we can spin it. Yep. Tighten the jaws and the chuck down here so I can spin it up a little faster. Well, that works. Let's button it up. That's it, we are now ever so slightly safer. And probably more importantly, we're running the VFD in the same configuration that was used for safety and compliance testing. Now, do I think it's that important in an installation like I have here? Obviously not, because I didn't install them the first time around, but in retrospect, the parts were inexpensive, and they were easy to install, and they do add an additional margin of safety, and. Who knows, maybe at some point in the future, I'll be glad they're there. That's all I have for you today. If you're enjoying these videos and finding them useful, please give me a thumbs up. Feel free to subscribe to the channel and leave me a comment. This video was actually in response to a comment and I'm always interested in hearing what you think and what you'd like to see in the future. Thank you for watching.